All right, guys, we're here with our buddy Matthew Mose with Serpa Mitra. He's got an awesome collection of colubrids and other different species. And uh, pretty sure this is the first time anybody's gone behind the scenes with you, right? Yeah, so this is the first time. Typically, I don't let people come over, obviously, because of biohazard security and stuff like that. Right. Um, obviously, I thought it'd be a good opportunity for the group to kind of see some of the different things, maybe talk about care. And. <laughs> <laughs> and go over lie. things like that. That's what happens when you leave windows open. Uh, <laughs> um, but in terms of Sarpamitra, so when I was in grad school for biomedical engineering, um, I ended up being friends with a lot of Indian people, and during that time, one of the students came over to my house and he's like, dude, you're like a Sarpamitra. And I'm like, what are you talking about? So in that conversation, Sarpamitra is actually Hindi for friend of snake. That's so, very fitting. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so going into it, kind of like um, how we got into it, I've always thought of reptiles as a hobby. Um, I used to go to Chicago Reptiles in Orland Park when I was a kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And during that time, my grandmother was really passionate about it in terms of like getting to read. So if I would read about the animal, learn about their different care, we would typically buy an animal and I'd take uh, care of it. That's a great uh, reward system. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, never allowed to have snakes. So if you're a mom or dad growing up and you don't want your kids to have snakes, this is what it can implode into. Uh, <laughs> Be but, warned. Yeah, right? <laughs> but in terms of like the species, um, I kind of got into it first with cocci and just kept growing it with different Asian species. Okay. Um, some of the different things that I've really enjoyed about this hobby is the networking part, learning about different species, and the challenge. Um, it can be very challenging. Yeah. You've actually worked with a lot of stuff that you've gotten out of the wild to kind of like do genetic diversification of the stock we have, right? Right. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how difficult it might be to start up something from a wild caught pair? Yeah, so for instance, um, cocci, you know, very common animal in terms of captive collections, but a lot of people don't know that Klaus Schultz, who is in Germany, mm -hmm. the original animals that all of our population in the hobby is actually centered around are five individuals. Wow. So for, you know, 20 plus years now, we've been breeding these cocci animals and same blood, right? Yeah. So everyone always talks, hey, can I get unrelated? Can I get unrelated? Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really good friends with Klaus. Um, I've learned a lot from him too as well. But a couple of years ago, I got lucky and I was able to pursue some wild caught cocci as hatchlings. Um, That's a beauty. Yeah. So. You know, you talk about mortality rate, um, heavy mortality rate. Yeah. Um, I've worked with a lot of wild caught Asians, um, wild caught African species, and when you do that, you really kind of want to get everything that you can. Right. Um, and you can expect 60 to 70 percent of those animals dying. Right. So this year, I hatched out. Um, about seven babies and oh, really yeah so just trying to well, that's awesome. bring back some of that blood into the hobby yeah, um, cool. and and kind of go into that um, and we, we were looking for cocci it's funny we we're just talking about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they're for sale right <laughs> uh, let's we'll, we'll talk about that one. <laughs> um, but you know other animals too so in the hobby it's it's I think cool because of the fact that you meet people. Mm -hmm. um, I've been lucky to network with people around the world and have projects with people not only here in the United States, but also in terms of overseas, Germany, Denmark, mm -hmm. um, all around. And when I was first getting into this, there was a gentleman by the name of Rex Knight who lived in Florida. Okay. And his name is really attached to conspicuatus, so the Japanese right. forest rat snakes. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you know, we talk about new species and getting into them. He would not sell me the animals um, until I had proven that I was able to take care of them effectively. Wow. Which is something like in this hobby, 
you know, you try to kind of get a picture or understanding of where they're going to be going. Yeah, make sure them a little bit, but like, yeah, but no one reads, no. right? Everyone wants no. a care sheet, and there are no care sheets on these animals. Yeah, you know, like you put out that rhino rat snake. I mean, no tried one does it. Tried to do it justice, but I don't know. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in terms of that, like, in Spix, it took me about three years to acquire my original animals. Mm -hmm. And I probably have the most diverse collection of conspicuolatas based upon locality. Um, right. I've seen them around a little bit, but if you say, oh, what locality is I, I don't know. I'm just lucky I have one that lived. Right. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> well, so you guys picked up some from me last year. Yeah. And doing good? Absolutely. Right. Growing the, beautiful. Oh, I love them. And the biggest thing on those is feeding. You mm -hmm. got to be patient. Um, yeah, you, we talked about that, man. <laughs> and I was always like, have a beer, relax. Yeah. Um, but in terms of kind of going over that, there is a wide variety in the hobby. More commonly are the Hunchu locale. Mm -hmm. um, there are Gifu, Hokkaido, Nagata, and there's also Japonica, which is a completely patternless animal. Okay. Um, we're going through some of these. So this is... Oh, I like that. A hunchu. This is actually the male that produced your animals. And yeah, hold on to its colors really nicely. Yeah. So, you know, when people always talk about this in terms of like beauty animals and things like that, these animals hatch out and. Piece of camera. <laughs> they have a I'm trying lot to keep it in the light. Identification <laughs> of different patterns. And if you yeah. look at them closely, it's almost like stained glass. That's yeah. the best way that I've ever been able to identify them or review them in terms of generalities. So these are both hunchus. And then... This is a Japonica. So these are extremely rare in collections. Oh, wow. That's completely patternless. The belly has no pattern. The body has no pattern and they hatch out like that. Um, they all come in different kind of colorations. Um, there are some that are like that metallic red, which is what I would consider that animal. And I'll show you a baby mm -hmm. too. But there's also like this metallic green oh, with wow. a solid oh, black yeah. belly. Now you got a bang going. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually a Hokkaido. I was really lucky to get these from my good friend, Jesper, in Denmark. Um, That's a beautiful animal, wow. Yeah, so you know, like people talk about in terms of like color, huge diversity, mm -hmm. right? So. And you're successfully breeding all of these localities? Yeah. Wow. Um, now, when these hatch out, sometimes they may not eat until their second year, right? Yeah, so when you told me that, I was like blown away. You're like, don't be worried if it, you may be lucky to get one meal in it before it goes down right. to hibernate and then come back. To, I'm like, a year before it eats its first time, I'm going nuts. Cause you know, we're Python people and right. that thing's dead if it hasn't eaten in a year. So. Yeah, so you know, like, um, this is a Nagata locale. Oh, wow. Um, this is actually one of the original wild caught animals that Rex Knight sent me. Wow. That's a female. She's over 30 this is years right old. Right out of the wild? Right out of the wild. Yeah, such good condition. Um, so Rex was friends with a gentleman in Japan, and the guy actually collected the female and the male and actually had GPS coordinates on it. So oh, when you nice. talk about like locality, You'll that's the only way. No, right? right? Wow. I mean, that's really the only way that I would ever trust locality. Mm -hmm. Um, now that animal, when they hatch out... Is the camera picking up the iridescence coming off of this? Not really. It like, it's rainbow colors. Yeah. Like, so that's dang. a baby. So this one hatched out last year and okay. didn't have its first meal until June this year. So went <laughs> a whole year crazy. without feeding. Whole year off the of egg sac. Yeah. Egg egg. So crazy. they hatch out real large babies and in terms of their growth and development, they just grow. Now when we start talking about Gifus, oh man, we'll see a baby there. <laughs> yeah. Now this one, 2017, 
animal. That's beautiful. Man. Now that the parents are. Yeah, sometimes it's stick. <laughs> yeah, that is the adult male from that pairing. So, you know, a lot of people have talked about it. Like, they don't hold their pattern. They don't hold their color. This is way better than you could expect with most species. Yeah. That's unbelievable. And like I said, like that stained glass, like when you're looking at them, mm -hmm. you see orange, you see red, you see green, you see yellows. Absolutely. Um, Got a huge depth of color. It's not just, and then the iridescence coming off of it as well. It's like, hey, don't go on my shirt. Let's <laughs> try to get a sneak preview. <laughs> this is before the auction. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> now, like when you talk about locality, right this is a hobby um pure locality awesome right mm -hmm. all these animals came with pure locality data but what happens when you have a spare female and you're curious about what an animal is going to look like when you cross locales because all the colors are different right right um put that one back. now if you cross them and the gata and a gipu this is the animal you get. Oh, so wow. you start reducing the pattern too as well. It gets real granity. That's a good representation, you know. Um, that's a 2014 animal. So that Nagata locale animal does not grow as fast as the Hunchus or Gifus. But when you look at them, I mean, one of the coolest parts about technology now is we all have that weather app on our phone, right? Mm -hmm. And we can punch in different towns, areas, and kind of get a better understanding of like snow, rain. Yeah, all the micro habitats and everything. Yeah, and get a better understanding. But when you look at that Nagata locale, it's cold all oh, year yeah. round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my guess is they're really just kind of foraging at certain times of the year and really just getting that food. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Now, over time, I would assume that um, natural behavior of feeding response will dissipate. But when we look at, you know, I still have animals that are 30 years old that were wild collected. Right. And not a lot of people are working with them. <laughs> no. To get, you know. <laughs> so, uh, Stan Grumbeck, um, I've been working with him out in Texas, and we have, he has animals at his house, I have animals in my house, and people get frustrated with the, the feeding thing. So, Stan usually, once he gets babies, end of the year, we exchange a box. Okay. And a box of animals goes to him and a box of animals come to me. And it's the cool part about having like that partnership or hobby, mm -hmm. both passionate about animals. So I've gotten some really cool things from Stan too. Um, That's awesome. Like for instance, I've been working with Stan. On ring pythons. Oh, wow. So. This is actually a male that Stan sent me in my box last year. So that. like when people talk about, you know, animals, this is like the right way why you want to pursue it. You really want to pursue it for the right reasons. A hobby, friendship, it really grows in that passion. Absolutely, man. That's and unbelievable. It, it, you see a lot of people going after this by themselves, but like, that's why like when we're working with our crew of people, like we have some people here, yeah from Jersey, we're always trying to like make connections and like have opportunities to get together and discuss things. And cause you can share that passion with people. It's like exponential how much more beneficial and fun it just makes the hobby. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, like we talk about it like internationally, like Norbert, uh, Jasper, Kloss. Um, I've really had a good time getting to learn a lot more too about those animals. Absolutely, you could share experiences, figure out, you know, I'm having this problem, what are you doing over there? Oh, I've never seen that happen before. Like, yeah, I mean, that's really what, you know, as a hobby and the passion it really should be. This is gorgeous. So that's that. Um, talked a little bit about wild caught animals. Um, so, Pursuing animals, wild caught. This is something that's kind of new to the hobby. These are the red and black snakes from Africa. Oh, so, go ahead. So these animals, 
Um, when I pursued them, I bought as many as I could mm -hmm. because wild caught animal you don't know. I've had these now in my care for over a year. Um, now when thinking about it, learning about them, most people would think African species, right? Mm -hmm. No, um, the heat will actually kill them. That's why I hear, like I've seen those pictures of this come across my Facebook feed, not from you, but from other people from, oh, I got this import, I got this import. Oh, is it still alive? No, nah, it's croaked because yeah. people, nobody, you don't get care sheets about these sort of things. So like you really have to do your research. And people say do your research, but like spend like months and months and years figuring stuff out before you go out and get these beautiful animals. Because well, yeah, you know, and even like when you're thinking about it, in terms of the care of these animals, mm -hmm. one of the biggest things is you have to watch them. You have to watch their behaviors, mm -hmm. learn about them in terms of their feeding responses, temperature. Are they spending all their time at the back of the cage? Are they spending their time at the front of the cage? Right. And really adjust. Mm -hmm. um, and you can expect a high mortality rate off of that. Yeah. Um, That's the. Uh the trick about getting new species established in private collections like this. Yeah, so I, I mean, even other species that are new to the hobby. These are Dinodons. So these are from Asia too as well. And fossorial species, but beautiful animals. Now a lot of these are heck animals. Um, there are some morphs that are common in the hobby. These were actually captive born. But in terms of their feeding responses, I mean, just a beautiful animal, weird, crazy head too as well, but they hatch out very, very tiny. Um, oh, so yeah. It, yeah, it's <laughs> taken me a little bit of time to kind of learn a little bit more about them and adjust accordingly. You should try anthills if you think hatching out tiny. <laughs> These actually hatch out smaller. <laughs> smaller than anthills? Yeah, so. And what do they eat? Um, Air? So, yeah, right. <laughs> um, when I got them, I was offered either straight out of the egg babies or established animals. Okay. Um, even in terms of some of the dinodons, they are so small that you would actually be force feeding them pinky mice legs. That's not very substantial. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, like the animal you just had, that's full grown. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it will get more size, obviously, but sexual maturity of an animal, golden. Okay. Um, now, one thing you probably would want to see are mandarins, right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. We've seen so, some pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's go. Oh, wow. So everyone thinks I photoshopped these. This is definitely photoshopped. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's Look taken a this. while to kind of get a lot of these animals in terms of colorations, kind of selectively breeding for different traits, right? Getting that yellow. Um, you know, even going as far as going towards examples. Oh, that's nice too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're being yeah. very well behaved. Yeah, right. <laughs> now the Vietnamese. Look at that tail shake. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Vietnamese are very different from the Chinese. Um, not only in terms of their personalities, but also their size. Okay. Um, so those were both females, and I'll show you a male. Um, some of these are in shed too, so I apologize for right. my snake's behavior, but that's what they do. I know they're gonna have company. So, this well, isn't a even one. a full grown mandarin. Um, and this is from. Yeah, so a lot of these are kind of selectively breeding for that yellow trait, right? Um, now, that one is in shed, it's actually going through it right now. But it's still very vibrant. Said, is that Chinese or Vietnamese? These are Vietnamese. But, you know, when breeding certain things, this one is deep in shed, but you can get crazy patterns like that wow. too. Um, That's amazing. Wow. And like I said, these are in shed. You can see it in their belly and eye, but um, think about the vibrance in terms of when those animals shed out too. So this is just an aberrant pattern? Yeah. Um, well, do you find them to be very polygenic or is it? I am still working on a couple of things. <laughs> um, what I ended up doing this past year was doing a lot of holdbacks. And I did holdbacks purely because I wanted to make sure that I secured the genes. 
we'll let you get bit. That's fine. But, <laughs> but like there now, when you're looking at like the stripe pattern of the animal, I mean, crazy. Every one. Every one's connected. Yeah. Wow. Sure. Now I've done a lot of pairings in terms of trying to secure these genes just for future generations and try to figure out different things as they come. Right. And I'm asking you, do you know if they're polygenic? Like, yeah, we're just starting to scratch the surface on all this stuff, so. <laughs> you, well, you know, like, um, for instance, I always see people like phrase stuff as like super high red, you know, like all these crazy. Mm -hmm. The reality, some of those animals are actually like that in the wild, like Northern Sichuan animals, super bright red animals. Okay. Um, and that's natural. It's not a morph, it's, it's physically just, it's coloration. Look at this thing, it's so beautiful. Now. <laughs> This is there, man. Oh, baby look at this. from one of those real high yellow animals. That's beautiful. The contrast on that is so stark. The blacks are like perfect. <laughs> yeah, and the hard part is with yellow animals, um, picking up through yellow on a photo does not happen very well. You can get underneath that light. That's beautiful. That's really good. There's even more aberrant patterning. Wow, you got dots now. <laughs> Watch Ryan try to juggle. <laughs> now the crazy part, wow. you saw an exanthic animal, you saw that white disappearing of the yellow. Exanthic animals actually hatch out with all their yellow and then it fades and gets okay. a white coloration in this Vietnamese exanthic animals. These wow. are not exanthics, but. That's amazing. Asian rat snakes can get pretty cold, right? Yeah, so a lot of people, I get a lot of comments and questions, you know, how cold do you get these animals during the winter? Or how hot not to get them. Right. Is another key. <laughs> yeah, so I do have thermostats on every one of these racks. Um, I do set them to, depending on the species, 74 to 76. Okay. But they never turn on. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> so the, I the same thing in my house. Yeah, like the reality, I just, I'm, want to make sure I yeah. want to be curious about it but a lot of people ask about bromation mm -hmm. you know like how do I successfully breed these species how cold do I have to get them so a lot of these things are coming from like mountainous ranges right of, yeah. uh, like Japan and stuff like that so you're talking about they probably have snowfall where they're at and it gets pretty low yeah so um, you know in terms of what I can do my room in the winter typically only drops to 60 65 okay but what I think is more important is lack of food, mm -hmm. so triggering it, right? You know, you get that cold weather coming in, you don't need to get these animals super cold, okay. right? So it's just that triggering in terms of trying to get them to realize, hey, we're going through a cycle. The season's um, changing, let's get some follicular growth going. Right, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's part of it too, for sure. Um, but you know, like 60, 65, no lights, uh, okay. So you get that photo cues in mm -hmm. terms of the animals themselves. Lack of food and then come in the spring, I usually cycle this room naturally with what's going on outside. So okay. right now we're entering middle of October, we want to start dropping that temperature because these animals are going to start going down. Right. Um, but for instance, like last year, we had a weird winter, start warming up, cold, warming up, cold. Right. Yep. I do the same thing. Okay. Um, I think barometric pressure outside is very important for that mm -hmm. follicular growth that changes. Some of these animals, conspics for instance, I think are very used to that and they sense it and because of that, they don't eat. Okay. They know they're not going to be able to digest the meal. Yeah, and so that's a really important thing like when we're talking about putting animals down for formation, always make sure that before they get too cold, you're making sure that everything's out of their digestive tract, right? Right. Because that'll basically kill them. 
pretty much, right? Well, <laughs> so um, I was curious a couple okay. of years ago, and on some of the conspics, I just started throwing in baby pinks for hatchlings. Okay. And some of them ate at 60 and digested perfectly fine. Wow. Now, That's amazing. Right, yeah. So, like, is that animal finding food in the winter? Maybe as a hatchling? Um, I don't know. Okay. But the reality of it. Well, they're opportunistic feeders, right? So, like, if they did come across something, and it's yeah. like a matter of life and death, I gotta eat. I'm sure they would eat it. Right, like garter snakes, for instance. Um, when I did my master's at Loyola, I did research on garter snakes and habitat selection, and I would find garters in the winter on snow, on okay. warm days. Wow. So it's possible. That is possible. You know, yeah. that's interesting. But more than anything, their metabolism slowing down during those colder periods. So you don't want to have a big meal in that animal right when you turn off temperatures. Right. Um, I guess you get to have all these different experiences and uh, your little trials to see what's going on because nobody's, who the heck is, has the ability to do that? So that's yeah. great information. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing, right? You've got to experiment a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is information out there in books. Um, there's a lot of stuff online in peer reviewed articles and journals. Um, it's just a matter Google. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, that's why, like, on some of the boards and stuff like that, when people ask, like, the same question over and over, you almost want to just say, hey, there's this book out there. You should probably pick it up and read it that's and true. learn about the animal. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back with the questions. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. Um, one thing I haven't showed you guys that I think would be really cool, um, in the U.S., these are kind of taking a little bit more shape, and these are Dion rat snakes. So okay. they're, I think, in terms of like, people always say, oh man, corn snake's like the best first time snake. Mm -hmm. I would actually negate it, and I think these are the best snake in the hobby for first time keepers, um, people that don't want to have a lot of lights, heat, and they stay small. Okay, um, well, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so these are Vladivostok oh, wow. Dion rat snakes. Um, Look at that. Now, in terms of some of these animals, there are actually natural variations and they're widespread. Okay. And for instance, some of these will actually, they found um, some of the reds or tigers, if you will, will actually have a red appearance. And then if you breed two reds together, you can get um, striped animals. And then if you breed two striped animals together, you can get like these sun glows. So it oh, just wow. keeps perfecting. Well, that's perfect for the hobby. That's, everybody wants to make their own art, huh? Well, and that's a full-grown male. Oh, wow. So that animal will not get any larger than that. So when you're thinking about an animal, you know, most kids, you don't want to have all these lights, especially if you have cats or dogs, stuff like that. Or some people are want something that's active and out. These animals make a great animal for... So where are these? What's the range of these guys? Russia, China, um, I mean, they're very widespread. I know we're talking about this, keeping them at the same temperature ranges as the- 70 to 75 degrees. Okay. So you could literally have these animals in a critter keeper on your desk, <laughs> yeah. or a kid could have this in his room. Um, but I mean, the gentle demeanor of these animals is amazing. They're very calm. Yeah, you know, not trying to bite, they're just Not cruising. even really running. Like, no. So that's why when ever some people ask, I always go, man, these are awesome animals for first time snake. And the cool part about this, if you even look at it in terms of natural history, mm -hmm. these animals have a long gestation period and okay. the eggs will actually hatch within four to 12 days of being laid. Wow, oh, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, these animals, I could feed mice from my fingertips, uh, pinkies for the babies. I mean, just a very, calm snake that's awesome how much do they go for uh so i really haven't sold any of these in the the u.s um some people have kind of picked them up um glenn out in california he uh inquired and posted some great pictures of them so it was a mutual trade-off um, but in terms of pricing you know in terms of all of the Dion's, anywhere from like $70 up to, I've seen a couple hundred. I very mean, affordable. Very reasonable. Wow. Yeah. But you know, when you're thinking about it in terms of care, no lights, no heating. Um, very easy. And that's full grown. 
Awesome, man. Thanks. And how many can we take with us? Or? <laughs> we, we can talk something. <laughs> ben, you said you weren't buying anything. <laughs> so that's a male, the adult male. That's a female. So they are very sexually dimorphic animals, too, as well. They really hold on to their colors well, too. Wow. Man. That's a cool snake. I mean, even the pupils are orange red, if you can get in there. And no musking on these. No musking, <laughs> there we go. Wow. What an animal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sneak peek. <laughs> now, yeah, cool, man. like these are no let more stop. No more royals. You know, hey. talking about like these orange red animals. Now we can even go further. When we talk about the other locales, these are Beijing animals. And now you get green, pink, yellow hues. That's an adult female too as well. Wow. But I think like the natural history of these animals is just amazing. Um, you know, now like if you're looking at the hobby, like these animals, color is usually what people go for. But I mean like, the hues on some of these is just immense. That's awesome. And that's full grown. Brighter isn't always better. I really love like all the granite speckling mm. on it. Yeah. Racing so stripes cool. down the back. It's beautiful. So in terms of rhino rats, um, I've worked with both Vietnamese and Chinese uh, locale look animals. At this. And I mean okay. so you know, Rob Stone, he was kind of one of the bigger producers of these animals in the hobby, kind of like one of the first goers. A lot of his stuff online, you'll hear him talk about force feeding pinky heads. Um, I'm one of those people, as long as the animal's feeding, that's the more important part. And it doesn't matter what the animal's feeding on, because you can obviously take care of parasites later if necessary. Um, but the natural feeding response provides no stress for the animal. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would hatch out babies, I got into the common aspect of putting a, a baby rosy red mm -hmm. inside the water bowl with a frozen thawed pinky. Right. Now, if you look about these animals in terms of natural history, as babies, they spend all their time in the water bowl, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't be surprised, and I haven't read anyone doing research on this, but I bet you that nose is a cue for actually sensory movement, and they're picking up that movement of the fish. Um, and that makes sense. Very similar to uh, tentacle snakes, okay. which have actually been studied for that. So they find their prey based on movement, so they're probably naturally eating tadpoles, um, fish too as well, but that movement with that frozen thawed pinky, nine out of ten times they take both the frozen pink yep. and the rosy red. Um, you know, something we've talked about in the past, but it's just getting the animal to feed. And that's the biggest thing. Yeah, we always the first four or five males just fish and then all right little baby pink in there too and yeah like you said nine times out of ten the bowl's empty yeah, yeah so. well and even too you know um like people have inquired about hatchlings from me i sell them both ways as pinky eaters and fish eaters and it's funny too i just recently shipped out two pairs of babies to a gentleman and they took pinkies to the first meal after shipping I bet you you would find a subset of people that would prefer to have fish eaters that don't want to deal with the rats. Yeah, <laughs> but in terms of like, you know, looking at these animals, I've been kind of pushing towards this like turquoise, that high speckling um, on yeah. the animals. I mean, that blue coloration is unreal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You see some of them, and I guess they have sort of like an octogenal change sometimes mm -hmm. where they get really like turquoise and teal looking. Yeah, and you know, some of it isn't genetics. Um, I think it really has to do with the locale of the animal. Um, I also think it depends on vitamins. Um, okay. I do supplement my rodents. Um, I do use vitamins, I do use calcium. Um, one of the things that I think, so I'm a science geek, but I don't think rodents are actually getting as enough of a calcium byproduct, just like humans. You know, we need a certain amount of sunlight to process D3. Right. Um, rodents, most breeders, where they have them, in a room with no light. Absolutely, yeah. So you're not getting that UVB, you're not getting that production. Um, so I actually have gone back and actually supplemented rodents too as well. That's interesting. 
We haven't done that yet, so maybe we'll give that a try. Because I want to tell the story about buying the last <laughs> Rhino Raptor. <laughs> so great. So I'm jumping in. I have Hiram back behind the camera because the last group of Rhino Rats that we bought from Matt, it was a funny Tindley store two years ago. <laughs> it wasn't last year, the year before. Um, Matt's like, uh, we we're talking about stuff, we're doing things. We're like, oh yeah, you know, we, we bought some snakes from him before. And Tinley's crazy, there's, you know, people are up late and whatever. I'm like hopping into bed at like 1 a.m. And he texts me, he goes, hey man. And I'm like, hey, and he's like, so do you want to buy some rhino rats? And I'm like, well, like right now? And he's like, yeah, I'm at a, I'm, I have some rhino rats here. There's like six of them. You know, I have a, a good deal on them. You want to do them? And I'm like, well, I don't know. And he's like sending me pictures of them. He's like sending me pictures of like him eating steak and like the things he's drinking and like just all this stuff. I like bourbon. Yeah, and so it's like. So he's like sending me all these pictures and I'm like, oh, dude, I'm like, a, I'm about to go, I'm like, how much? And he's like, he tells me and I'm like, uh, sold. Send him the money and I go to sleep and I wake up and Ryan's like, I'm like, hey man, I so bought. We were, we parted ways at like 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I wake up in the next morning, all of a sudden he's like, I bought snakes. I'm like, where did you buy snakes <laughs> overnight? Yeah, it was like, <laughs> the in the middle of the night. It was a really funny, like, good time. So. Oh yeah, there's this no guy's sure. this guy's put us into a handful of uh, snakes just at the drop of a hat sometimes. Yeah, I I never uh, lead you astray in, yeah. in bad deals. Well, we're glad to have somebody that nice. can come across amazing animals and be like, hey, we what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> right. Wanna, you want to do something? Uh, in other That's awesome. animals, That's one so thing cool. we could touch on. For for racy, I have all four subspecies here, which yeah, Ben really wants to do that. We. We are missing cock size, the only porphyracious that we don't have. Yeah, you got Volante from me. We got which, all of them all from you. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> all of the, the commonly lads. available ones. I know well, there's a couple ones that might be. So I'll I tell you, Latisinctus is like my favorite. Yeah, so Lats and Coxi probably get the most credit just because they're color. Yeah. Um, but I recently, there was recently an article published, and the Volante you bought from me is maybe not Volante, but a new species of porphyracea. Um, based upon the locality. <laughs> oh yeah. So the Porphyracea complex has actually been further explored and they think there is Volante and another species in that same geographical area. I'll send you the paper. Okay, yeah, um, please. But it goes over the different traits. Now one of the, the bigger traits in terms of like the Volante are, or is, the respective pattern is they get to be Adults. So, like that one. <laughs> oh yeah, bike time. <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. We're all buddies here. Ryan's such a snake whisperer. But when you look at them, this oh, Volante, yeah. they, they hold the patterning. Yeah. Which is not, so the more common Volante in the hobby is the Vietnamese, which okay. ends up developing and looking very similar coxi where you have no pattern right oh, yeah so this has been recently explored a little bit more and they do think that the chinese are actually a new subspecies that's interesting i'm i'm excited to read that paper yeah uh, it's pretty cool um but you know right you you think about it in terms of wild caught these animals came from wild caught animals from Rex Knight who had bought some from Cameron at Bushmaster in the early 90s um, and luckily had some live, right? Mm -hmm. um, now I work with both the Vietnamese and also the Chinese um, so it's kind of unique in terms of that distribution. Uh, talked about Cox's eye. Now one of the weird parts about the hobby is people have started crossing subspecies. And I know Poe's Arts was doing that a little bit. Yeah, so I haven't bred these. These were given to me as a gift. Um, and I probably won't produce these. I'll probably just keep them just as pets for their life. That animal you have is actually all four subspecies together. Really? Lepsinctus, Coxi, Volante, and Pulcher. That's hmm. interesting. <laughs> yeah, so what ended up happening was the gentleman wanted to see what happened in terms of coloration, demeanor of the animal as they developed. 
Um, took multiple generations, right? Obviously to get that ammo because you have to pair, pair, yep. pair. Um, yep. But that's all four. It's so funny, the color and the pattern, you can tell, like, aren't right. Like, well, they're different. It's just so funny. You look at the head, that's a female. You look at the head of the animal, you look at the body. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in this hobby right now that are misrepresenting these subspecies because yeah. what happened, I mean, it's probably no surprise, but as you get more and more, right, it is a hobby. So, I mean, people can do whatever they want. Yep. It's just a matter of representing the animals properly. Um, you know, if you're going to cross them, go at it. I call them bastards. Um, <laughs> But, oh, I thought that was what's gonna bite me. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but you know, like, right? You go down multiple generations, generations, and you get this animal, and you're like, no, that's not a coxa. Yeah. That's not a less than this. Um, for instance, like with coxa, when you look at them, right? You have this natural dorsal pattern, right? Yeah. Now, some of these animals will actually hatch out with bands. Now, you can tell a pure coxa from a hybrid because if those bands actually extend outside of the dorsal stripes, that's usually a cross. Okay. So something that hasn't been talked about a lot, um, but there are ways of determining, you know, is this animal this? The saddles or stripes across will actually fade out in cocci as they develop. Right. In some of those crosses, you'll actually see those saddles continue on throughout their life. Okay. Well, that's interesting information. I never heard that. Um, so there's nothing really wrong with having bastards. The bastards. They're great uh, pets, right? Yeah. I but mean, make sure if you're trying to do like keep the purity of the localities, get them from a trusted source that knows what they're talking about, not just somebody that says, "Oh, we imported them and they said this." You're telling me you're getting like actual like GPS coordinates of where things have been yeah. picked up. I've been so, lucky, you know, yeah. for some of that stuff. Obviously, right, you trust your source too. Absolutely. Well. Um, you know, it, it gets further and further into it, but when you get into it, locality itself, I mean, right, you could make up stuff too. Absolutely. Um, but over time, I've met a lot of people and I've learned different things. Um, these guys are kind of cool. We've been getting a lot of representation in the hobby lately. These are green bush rat snakes. Um, it's the rhino rat snake without the nose. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, beautiful animal. Um, I've been working with Stan on these um, past couple of years. Uh, we have both Vietnamese, which is what this animal is, and Chinese locality animals. Um, difference between the two, colorations, pattern, breeding behavior, seasons. Um, when the eyes, when they're hatchlings, the eyes will actually develop a little bit different. Oh, really? Um, you'll see blue eyes or yellow eyes. Um, real easy animal. These take pinkies right out of the egg. Um, hatchlings are kind of small. I bred these Vietnamese for the first time this year. I'll grab. Got it here. Oh, see, they're so cute when they're tiny. So that's a baby. And you'll see like that bluish, greenish eye. Um, now you can keep these in a terrarium. They do awesome in a terrarium. Uh, especially if you want a observation animal to be cruising around, make a great animal. They're not always in the water bowl like rhinos. So most of these animals that we're talking about are actually diurnal, right? Yes. Which means they're active during the daytime, not sleeping all day and up all night while you're asleep. So if you want a beautiful display animal, this is where you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you want to live. <laughs> well, you know, even too, um, talking about wild caught animals, longevity, trying to figure out things. Um, one of the other things that I've really been playing with over the past like three to four years are the African file snakes. I saw you posting those. Yeah. Those are cool. <laughs> so not many people are breeding them in captivity. Mm -hmm. um, they're commonly imported. If you buy import, you really need to get them checked out by a vet. Okay. Um, they, I, I found out a lot as I went through keeping these, but these are some babies that hatched out this year. Oh. Um, Oh, they so, feel so cool. Beautiful. So they have animal. keeled scales, right? Yeah, so a lot of misrepresentation here, too, as well. Babies, adults, they eat rodents readily. Okay. Um, a lot of people interpret them as a snake eater. Um, will they eat other snakes? Yeah, but 
Um, reality of it, even when I had babies and some babies weren't feeding, I tried feeding them hatchling corn snakes, just trying to get them to feed. No. Mm -hmm. um, they ended up taking pinkies eventually, um, but in terms of getting them going, they'll eat rodents. Um, that one takes like three to four pinkies of feeding. So how often are these being produced in captivity here? Uh, I am probably the only person in the United States breeding those in captivity. Um, you know, sometimes um, people will get wild caught animals that are gravid, mm -hmm. and then they'll hatch out babies. But there's also, these are cape file snakes. So this is the more uncommon species of file. Okay. Um, so in terms of care, or something like this, not that it'd be readily available, but yeah. if somebody did. Care is real easy. Um, I keep them on cypress mulch. Keep them at 80 to 85 degrees. Okay. Um, they do really well. Um, they burrow in the substrate. Um, they kind of remind me sometimes like tremors because they'll come out of the ground and like <laughs> go for the rodent right away. Yeah. Um, adults. So these are some established adults that Dude, these over are the cool. years. Whoa. So you gotta awesome. start somewhere, right? You can't even appreciate cool. this until you actually have it in your hands and, so and feel it. This animal is wild caught, oh my goodness. been in captivity for four years. So this is the baby, this is the mom? That's the mom. Give you this. Oh man. Now that sick. one's in shed, you can see it with that, but the purple hues on that animal. Let me get in light better here. You can see the iridescence on the belly, I hope. It's yes. glowing like rainbows, man. This thing is beautiful. Awesome. You gotta feel these scales. Off camera, I'm going to. Oh my goodness, they're so cool. Dude, this is ridiculous. And like, so I've never been attempted to even bite mm -hmm. at. Um, just Effort super again. calm animals. That's what I'm noticing. It's just like chilling. It's like not. Mo mainly when we're talking about Kalubas, I'm used to things that are trying to run, like that just thrashing, going all over the place. This is. I'm just so impressed. Yeah, real gentle demeanor. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, get into some, like I said, the capes. You'll really see that oh purple. Oh my goodness. So they're way more glossy, it seems. Yeah. But still, you feel that keel. It is a little more active. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I was lucky to... You know, friends in the hobby, big names. Um, Philippe Devogio has actually sent me. That's like purple. Yeah. Oh uh, two of his females to work with, since they're not heavily represented in the hobby. And what's nice about these animals that he had sent me was the fact that they're wild caught. Oh, nice. So, adding some new blood to the hobby too, as well in the process. Absolutely. Um, just really gorgeous animals. Um, they are. This is an There's so many I wanna, so many things I wanna get here. This is crazy. <laughs> so this is another one. I mean, just the- Purples in that are just, I've never seen that in a snake. Wow. But you can tell they've been wild caught because you can see the scars yeah, on them. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed to be in really great shape. Yeah, you know, like that one, that will actually eat two small rats a meal. Um, they readily take frozen thawed, um, real easy animal to take care of. Cool, man. Thanks for showing us these. That's just like, got me thinking. <laughs> then, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else? How about mole and door fly? We haven't talked about those. Yes. All right. 100 so, fly rats. 100 flowers. So, I always use a hook. Um, yeah, Brandon, get in there. <laughs> a lot of species. And the reason why is just the settling, right? Yeah. Um, you don't want to startle an animal with this nice just laying. Head. Oh, yeah. I'm a sucker for redheads, too. But, um, is this cool to hold? Yeah, go ahead. So, this animal is actually on breeder loan from Larry Keller. Um, this is an aberrant male. It's actually a recessive gene. Um, so, you get that reduced pattern of the animal itself. 
um, but you get like this solid. It looks like a 50 flower rod snake. Right? Yeah, right? <laughs> Reduced. <laughs> um, but solid, orange tail, just beautiful animal. Now there is sexual dimorphism within these animals too as well. Um, the males get much larger. Okay. Um, Carl Crumpke, Stan Grumbeck, um, two big guys that have worked with Mullendorf Eye over the years. And one of the things that I found interesting was a picture Stan once sent me of Carl with like this 10 foot long wow. Mullendorf Eye. Um, That's happens. pretty impressive. <laughs> um, 10 foot long, man. Beautiful hypo. So, I work with hypos, aberrants, um, primarily anymore. I don't produce normals anymore just because I've been trying to kind of bring in some of these newer genes. And also I'm curious what an aberrant hypo animal looks like. Um, so over the years, I'll definitely find out more about those. Um, so that's an aberrant. And this. is a hypo. So when you really start looking at the animal, you get even more. More reds. Yeah, red, orange, um, like a yellow pattern too as well. Um, so this is something long term I'm, I'm hoping to work with, um, with Stan especially on like aberrant hypos. Um, I'm also curious what happens when you breed an aberrant to an aberrant. Um, do you get a really reduced animal hmm. or what kind of happens there? Um, has so it been done is that the, I know of? Is the guess that it's a gene or if it's polymorphism? No, it's a gene. A um, gene? Yeah. So it could have a super. It could. If we're talking ball python language. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Cameron at Bushmaster, he used to offer these. He was working with a gentleman out there in Colorado that had a group of animals. I don't know what happened with those animals, um, but Cameron hasn't offered babies over the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, it also seems like there aren't many people working with Mullendorf eye. There's not a lot that I know of. You know, one of the big things too with Mullendorf eye is their time for sexual maturity. Um, it's a long project. Okay. When looking at the sexual maturity of these animals, typically females take about five years to mature to um, sexual reproduction. That so, is an investment in time. Yeah. And but well worth it. Right. You get this awesome, cool, long colubrid cruising around. It mm -hmm. is beautiful. Oh my goodness. And big. I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, so what do you think, Ben? <laughs> Pack it up. <laughs> well, I'll have eggs hatching here soon. Um, eggs typically take over 90 days to incubate. They have this really hard shell too as well. And instead of cutting an egg, they actually burst through the side of one of the polar ants, like literally burst right through That's it. Fun. Um, you know, I don't know if you looked at like the, the face, but they have a real strong frontal appearance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that one that I just pulled out is a head aberrant. Um, Chappas, this is kind of a new species to the hobby too as well. You know, kind of got to see them a little bit, but they were running. I told you I'd pull out a baby too. Alright. So that's a female. The palm of my hand. <laughs> the palm of my hand? Really? Only person I've ever seen get bit in the palm of his hand is uh, Sean Childers uh, when he was screwing around with a black rat snake. Um, Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, like, you see those. Uh, <laughs> and there is a lot it's of okay. diversity in these you. animals. Like here's a hashling. Yeah, they're super like the contrast when they're babies. The yellows and reds are so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Man, you have an excellent collection. My goodness. Well, it took a while to to find that hobby. Um, you know that That's selective kind of focus. The palm of my head. <laughs> I also work with Stan Grumbeck on leopard rat snakes. Oh, wow. um, these guys seem to have kind of fallen off in terms of, you know, being present in the hobby anymore. These are Croatian locale animals. Um, they do great 
great animal, not a very high reproductive rate, typically one to three eggs. Oh wow. Um, a beautiful contrast, also a great display animal too as well. Now will these double clutch like other rat snakes? Or? Um, I haven't had Citula or leopard rats double clutch in my care. Okay. Um, is it possible? Yes. Um, Stan Grumbeck, he, he's really kind of known too as well, not only for the moles, but also for Persian rats. He mm -hmm. did a lot of stuff with piebald Persians. Okay. And over the years with working jointly together, right, you, you get a whole bunch of hatchlings, we've held back pretty much everything. Right. And one of the things we found is when Stan was working with them, he primarily did Persian uh, pies to pies, mm -hmm. and it's kind of uneventful, but it is happening. As those animals actually sexually mature mm -hmm. to adulthood, they actually get kinked backs. Oh, really? So we're not sure whether or not it's the gene itself, or maybe breeding too closely, That's or possible, yeah. maybe vitamins and calcium too. So we've kind of played a lot with a lot of that stuff too as well. A lot of experimentation has to happen, huh? Yeah, <laughs> takes time. So yep. that's why when you hold back animals, try to figure it out. I mean, it's really just kind of walking through it. Um, that's awesome. Is that a leopard? <laughs> we can talk about king rats. Um, so king a lot of, rat. Yeah, Baby so king rats. King rats. Um, a lot of people have kind of really gotten into these now too as well. There's a lot of different colorations, patterns too as well. Um, there's albinos, right? Yeah, so there's two different types. There's T negatives, T positives, there's a hypo. Um, there's anarays or exantics, depending on who you talk to. Um, they do get large. Mm -hmm. They're not as active of like a biting species. Getting close on the head. But they're definitely um, a species that will run. So they're, um, they're called king rats because- They'll eat other snakes. And they kind of like mimic the look of the king snake or the uh, king cobra <laughs> right um you know in, in terms of these uh clint bartley and i we've big collection of these two as well a lot of those are in evansville at his facility but you know joint projects you have good times you have bad times but it's really been kind of plan. building up and trying to make like double head hypos um with albino genes too as well really high yellow animals too you know it, it's one that of those sounds things like a fun project man. yeah that's yeah, Clint and I, Stan, um, even, I mean, everyone that I work with on projects, we kind of shoot emails or Facebook messages back and forth, text, you know, hey, I'm seeing this, like, what do you think about this? Um, I've learned a lot, too, with black rat snakes, which I also do with Clint Bartley. Um, locality on black rats is like, it just throws off color mutations like crazy. Oh, yeah? Um, I'll put this guy back and I'll, I'll show you some blacks. He's been getting a lot of attention lately over the years. Um, this is an amel or albino brindle animal. Now, the brindle gene, if you look at some of them, you get like this real crazy cool patterning. Um, but when you look at locality of the animal, I think this one's in shit, you can get like these oh, really different black rats. Um, now, locality itself really plays a huge role in this. Um, especially over the years, we've been kind of playing with it, picking up different animals. Um, so those are Amel or albino brindles. And where's the locality of these? You know what, for some of these, I don't even know, to be honest with you. Um, it just plays such a different role. But these are like the black rat snakes we get in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. But just crazy differential. Um, you know, That's insane. Like, they're very mild mannered. <laughs> yeah, once they're out. I pick one of these up in the wild, they're like, I'm coming <laughs> for you. <laughs> well, so, like, we've been working with Amels, Albinos, Leucistics. Um, and then it looks like what we found is there's actually two ways of inheritance for Leucistic animals. Um, so, it's a blue eyed Lucy black rat. Oh. Um, and then if you have het albine or het leucistic animals, they commonly call them rusties. I didn't even know there were leucistics in black So if you breed two rusties together, you get leucistic and rusties. The gorgeous eye. Good luck. Like silver and blue. <laughs> Trying to pop the camera. Man, these are so cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> 
black rats have really kind of grown in popularity over the years. Um, there's even natural um, morphs like the calico or cow suckers. They have like, they hatch out this yellow, vibrant. I don't have any here right now because they're at Clint's house, but. Okay. This was, let's see. This was in my box from Stan Grumbeck last year. These are Mexican burrowing pythons, also known as Loxacemus bicolor. Um, you will not see these. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen wild caught animals of these in years, um, but like that shine, that iridescent, um, that burrowing behavior, I mean. You no, know, it sounds like disingenuous that I keep saying, this is so beautiful, this is amazing, but like you're pulling out some crazy stuff I've never even seen. Like, this yeah, is and awesome. not morphs, I mean, right? These are all naturally yeah. occurring animals. Mm. That's wild. Definitely see the iridescence in that one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so guys, I'm serious. Everything here is great. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's better than cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, da, 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 da. So, these are Scoopion rat snakes. Scoop. Um, now these guys, cool thing about them is they're the snake that's on the medical symbol. So oh, these really? are the two snakes that are wrapped together jointly around it. And what I actually like about these animals, I don't know if you've noticed, but like an animal needs its whole body wrapped around you. Like yeah. as if it needs just that comfort. Um, awesome animal, real docile too as well. Um, but just something you don't see very commonly that I thought I'd pull out for you. The gold colors are beautiful. Cool. <laughs> cool. Really excited to be here. It's amazing. <laughs> just funny you hear the same like repeat every time you're in a video. Uh, I'm super excited. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. This is Russian rat snakes. They've really gotten a lot more popularity too over the years. Um, large colubrid, very gentle demeanor too as well. Um, that is a full grown, I think that was a female that I pulled out. Um, but again, great beginner snake, um, very docile, just an overall beautiful animal. Um, I've been breeding kind of selectively. I have some het melanistics, which would produce solid black animals. Okay. Um, I'll hopefully produce them next year. I also have some that have a higher yellow contrast as well. So it really kind of comes into, you know, again, selectively breeding for those traits that you want to actually see later on in life. That's awesome. I think this is a great place to wrap it up with this beautiful giant black Russian rat snake. Awesome. <laughs> So do it. So we just want to thank you so much for letting us come see your collection, man. I know it's sort of like a tight clothes, uh, like very secure. Uh, what do you say, biosecure? Is yeah, what we yeah. Do here because we have a lot of unique species. We don't want to mess it up. So it's awesome that you let us in, and thanks so much. Shh, come here, man. <laughs> it was amazing. Is there anything that you want people to check out? Like, uh, you link? can follow my Facebook page, Sarpamitra. Uh, you can also go to our my website, Um Yeah, I'm always interested in talking to new people in the hobby, um, whether newbies or, you know, some of those people that might have more genuine interest in keeping some of these rarer species. Um, like I said, I mean, a big part really is kind of reading and learning about the species before you pursue them. Um, it's one of those challenging habits, so... It's hard to resist. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, follow your passion for animals and, and keep what you want to keep what you want. I mean, that's the bigger picture. Amen. Right on. Surfamitra.com. <laughs>